Good night. Good night, people of God. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, I am thoroughly enjoying the service so far. What a wonderful time in the Lord. I just um, saw, right before I came on, I saw a testimony by Connie in the chat. She said her father had a couple strokes recently. He felt another happening today. My mother called me and we prayed and it was deterred. Thanks be to God. Well, that is not a small feat that is major. Um, bless the Lord, you know, um, Brother White, as Connie's dad, has been having some health issues and we have been praying um, earnestly and persistently. And, you know, it we know that without the power of prayer, Brother White wouldn't be here today. And we can see the hand and the move of God in his life. And so we're just going to continue to pray and to believe in complete and total healing. Amen. This service so far is so aligned and anointed. Usually, sometimes, Minister Shardov, she's doing worship. She will message me and ask if, if we have a topic, if we have a theme. And that did not happen tonight. And when I saw the militant demeanor in Minister Sharda and with the song choice she chose, I knew it was a Holy Spirit break every chain, could not have been more perfect um, and in alignment with what we believe the Lord is saying and what we want to share tonight. So that was just such an awesome ministry. You know, I just want to thank the Lord that he's here. That's just confirmation of his presence and his power that is working tonight. And I believe that everyone, all 43 plus, because I know multiple people are listening on devices. So we probably have 60 people or even more online tonight. And I believe that every single person here, you know, this, this word is for you. And what it is tonight, it's a tool. It is something that is going to give us an edge over the enemy, continue to give us victory over the enemy and continue to help us to persevere, amen. And I want to go right into that. Father, we just thank you and we praise your name, mighty God. We thank you for your word. We thank you, mighty God, for using my tongue. We thank you for using me, mighty God to bless your people tonight, Lord. I thank you for deliverance and healing. I thank you for uh, revelation, mighty God. I thank you, Father, for your power manifested here tonight, mighty God. Will you have your way, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, um, Apostle shared that testimony. And the truth is, you see that, kettle and toaster, it was just a sign to us that God is here. You know, it was a sign and a reminder that God is with us and that we are favored. And do you know that, and you probably experience the same thing, that there's sometimes some things you're asking God for, it just seems like it can never come. And there are other things that just seem to come through like that. You feel favor just following you, it's effortless, it's easy, you know, and we experience that a lot. You know, um, for example, I, I had an appointment at the eye doctor and, you know, bottom line is I, it was an emergency appointment because I had no contact lens left and you always have to order and it's shipped in and it takes weeks. And I didn't really know what I was gonna do. And in fact, when I went to that appointment, um, they sent me back to come back the next day because I didn't have the machine to measure my eyes. And you know what? I wasn't annoyed by that. I just felt a piece about it and I was like, all right, fine. And I went back in the morning and got through no problem. There was no wait. There was no issue. The doctor was there. You know, I saw her, no problem. And she said, she knew I had no contacts left. And she said, well, what are we going to do? She said, let me see if I have anything here. And she looked and she said, um, oh, there's somebody, there's, there's contacts here with their exact strength. And then she said, let me, let me see if this actually belongs to somebody. Somebody had ordered or whatever it was. 
And she came and she says, oh, yes, it is. Let me call them and see, because I think there might be an extra set. She called, she couldn't get through. But then she looked at me and she said, well, it's your lucky day. And she gave me the contact lenses. And I walked out of there after spending like half an hour total, right? Zero bill, having the contact lenses and, you know, something I thought I'd have to order and actually having a, two boxes of contact lenses in my hand. And it was like, wow, what a great start to my day. And, you know, I, I was saying to my husband, wow, look how this was just favor. It could only have been God. And, you know, I went about my day as usual, but that stuck with me that that was so easy, you know, and when you're aligned with the Lord and when favor is on you, people want to bless you. People want to do things for you. And you don't even know why this, I'd never, my first time at this optician, she didn't know me. There's nothing that would make her want to favor me, but she favored me, you know, nothing in the natural at least. But then there are other things that you're asking the Lord for, are you believing in faith for? And it just doesn't come, <laughs> you know, it's like, it feels never ending. It feels like an uphill battle, you know? And why is that? I believe that those things that take longer, it's because it's related to your purpose. God wants us to walk in favor always. But when it comes to our purpose, why are some things harder? And one reason is that the enemy fights us because the enemy fights our purpose. He doesn't want us to become who God has called us to be. He doesn't want us to operate um, to the fullness of our ability in the kingdom of God. He doesn't want us to save souls. He doesn't want us to break chains. He doesn't want us to defeat him, even though he's already defeated. And so the enemy will attack anything that even looks like purpose, right? And sometimes when you find that you consistently have a hard time in an area, and I mean, we have to be, we have to really assess the situation because if you are new to Christ, especially, you know, the Lord might use certain things to train you. So it may not always be witchcraft. It could be that God wants you to persevere. He wants you to get into the word of God. He wants you to, to, to speak the word of God persistently in your situation before something breaks. But when you find a situation where you are doing to the best of your knowledge and ability, you're being obedient to the Lord and you're doing what he's called you to do and what he's asking you to do, but you feel resistance in an area of your life and it's consistent, then that's a sign that the enemy is attacking you in that area. And it's also a good indication that that area has something to do with your purpose. There's an assignment there that's important in your life. And so the enemy has decided to target you in that area. And it can be various things for different people, right? It just depends. It could be your workplace. It could be your health. It could be your family life. It could be difficulty having children, difficulty getting married. You know, whatever you find the enemy might be attacking, it could definitely be linked to your purpose. I've received op opposition in, in, in many areas of my life. But there are some key ones, you know, and one was when I was getting married, there was a lot of opposition there by the enemy, definitely. Um, there was a lot of opposition, um, even though it, it wasn't, it wasn't too much of an intense battle. But when I was pregnant and having Caleb, there was a lot of spiritual warfare surrounding that. And we named Caleb intentionally. His name is Caleb because of um, what, God was saying to us and where we were transitioning and at the edge of a new season, here I was pregnant. And so it was very symbolic and we named him Caleb and Caleb means faithful and brave. And enemy hated that. And so from the womb, the enemy was trying to kill Caleb. And so you know that you're doing something right, amen. Now, give me one second. I'm just trying to pull up my notes. I have all these notes and I'm talking, just talking <laughs> to you um, as I feel the Lord is leading me.
because I believe the, want, the Lord wants us to get militant tonight. And there are times when, you know, you pray and you warfare a little bit and, you know, there's no great instruction um, to, for spiritual warfare. And there are moments and seasons and times when God says, no, nope, attack that spirit now. And I believe that's what we're doing tonight. And I believe we're attacking the spirit of witchcraft tonight. And that is what my message is about. Minister Sharda sang about breaking every chain. And there were so many chains that were declared broken. I mean, the, she said so many apostles put more in the chat. It was just amazing and very prophetic and extremely symbolic. And I hope you followed that instruction that she, she shared to, to name that chain that is you believe is affecting you, you know, in that anointing. It's important that we follow instructions like that because there's something happening in the spiritual realm. I know I certainly did, you know, and we have spoken about witchcraft before. If you have been on Evolve um, and been following us for a while, you would have heard that already. Um, we do talk about it from time to time. And why is it something that we continue to speak on and continue to pray about because the enemy is always there, right? First Peter 5, eight to nine says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him firm in your faith. So if you're feeling the call and the nudge to pay attention to any possible attacks of the enemy or any possible witchcraft attacks, it's not that you're doing something wrong. It doesn't have to even be that you haven't been vigilant. It's just that the enemy is always looking for an opening. And so you might find that there are times when God says, hey, pay attention here. And the signs may come through dreams, physical signs. You may just sense that presence, things may be happening in your life. You know, we can talk about that a little bit later on. I don't think we'll get through everything tonight, but we will continue. But we need to start that conversation and we need to continue to attack the enemy in prayer. So the enemy is always there, always seeking to devour someone. But the good news is that we have the victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know, he who is least in the kingdom of God has more power than any antichrist, right? He who is even the least in the kingdom of God, if you just got saved a minute ago, you have more power than the enemy. But the truth is that just like the greatest military power today is vulnerable if it does not recognize the enemy's attacks, we too are vulnerable if we do not recognize Satan's schemes. And many times Satan and his minions, many times what they do is they get in through our ignorance or an area of our life that we just left neglected. And so it's not that they're stronger than us, but they just manage to sneak through. And from time to time, then the Lord has to have us deal with certain areas to make sure that we can strengthen our spiritual barriers and our spiritual boundaries so they cannot get in. You know, there are times when um, Pastor and I are under attack, witchcraft attack, and we know because things are happening in our lives. I'll give you examples as we go along. And it's always confirmed with dreams. So we may dream lizards, that's common. Um, I remember once we dreamt, well, I dreamt lizards were all over the bedroom and we were killing them. My husband was killing lizards like crazy. And some of them are dead and they were dropping like flies and it was an intense witchcraft attack. But God was telling us that we have the authority and we already have the key to defeating it. And we just have to continue doing it. Um, once a uh, puzzle dreamt recently, a frog outside our balcony door did not come in, but he was there. And that's a 
that's the Lord nudging to say, hey, there's a spirit here that's trying, that wants to get in. And so we know how to pray to make sure it doesn't get in. So um, you can dream rats, sometimes roaches. Um, I, I've dreamt in the past a big rat in my kitchen. There was a big attack, uh, rats in my fridge. And I'm grateful for those dreams because it tells me what's happening in the spiritual realm and it shows me how to pray, how to pray. And so sometimes when everything is going wrong, I, I feel better when I know that it's witchcraft because at least I can name it. And at least I know how to handle that through prayer, through fasting, making my declaration, standing on the word of God, standing in that spiritual authority the Lord has given us and it must break because that's what the word of God says. So we're not gonna be complacent and certainly not tonight. And if you do not know much about witchcraft, well, you learn something tonight. Take out a notebook, write down these points and the important notes, write down the things that you feel the Holy Spirit saying to you. You know, I may say something that kind of nudges you. And so you're like, hey, let me look into that. Write it down, right? Because that's important. But we're not going to be ignorant to the plans of the enemy. So if you've never heard of witchcraft before, you know, listen to, to what the Holy Spirit is saying now and write these things down. So what is witchcraft? Essentially, I see you, Shauna. I'm going to come back to that. I'll have to remember to come back to that point you made. What is witchcraft? Using an unholy spirit to dominate, manipulate, or control others. The essence of witchcraft is manipulation and control. It is using a spirit to control someone else, right? And so if you're under witchcraft attack, I mean, I'm simplifying it as best as I can. It's because the spirit wants to control you, wants you to do what, what it wants you to do. And that's always, the aim is always to move you from God. There is no good witchcraft. As much as the world wants to say good witches and all, there's no such thing. This is not of the Lord. Galatians 5, 19 says that the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual imm immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, dis discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here we're talking about the acts of the flesh and there are several of them named and witchcraft is amongst it. Witchcraft usually starts out carnal and then it becomes demonic. And carnal means it starts out in the flesh, like a, a fleshy desire that we may have. And then if it's not dealt with, we don't repent and submit to the Lord, it can very quickly become demonic. For example, I am single, and I have a boyfriend, Peter, and I want to marry Peter. And Peter is not God's will for me. But not only that, Peter doesn't want to marry me. But my desire for Peter is so strong and I cannot, I don't want to let go of him that I start to do things in a way that are manipulative to aim to control this person or trick them or control them into wanting to be with me, right? So it can start out just in the flesh. It's my desire. And the Lord says, wants none of it. The person wants none of it. But if I don't submit to that, it can very quickly become something that's demonic. So what does that mean? That means that a spirit comes and whether or not I'm aware of it, right? This spirit is going to come now and assist me whether or not I'm aware 
of it in controlling this person, manipulating this person, dominating this person. And that person is gonna feel the effects of witchcraft. Make sense? I have a bag and the bag was given to me and it's from Africa and it was given to me by a friend. But every single time I see this bag, I just get angry. I carry the bag with me and just bad things are happening. I don't really understand it. And I get a, a word from the Holy Spirit to do some spiritual house cleaning check items in my house. And when I look at this bag, I feel cross in my spirit, something isn't right. Now this happens a lot with items and it may be nothing at all to do with the person that gave you the item, because that could just be innocent. They bought a bag from somebody and they decided to gift you. But perhaps the maker of the bag has origins in witchcraft, Obia, voodoo, mix up in the occult, and they made the bag. And whether intentionally or unintentionally, a spirit attaches itself because of this person to the bag to every, and goes out to everybody who it's sold to. Another point is that that bag, owning a bag like that may not affect everybody, but it could affect me because this spirit is targeting me. So maybe Jane can own the same bag. It doesn't affect Jane. But me owning the bag, it, it is basically trying to destroy my life. And that's because um, spirits attach themselves to those objects and affect you. And that is through witchcraft as well. So that's why it's also very important to know what's in your home. What's the origin of what you have? Where is it from? Who gave it to you? There could be instances even from past relationships. Um, that the Lord says, hey, that ring, it might have just been a promised ring, but because of the ungodly nature of that relationship, it wasn't sanctioned by God, and the Lord wants you to move forward to who he has for you, the Lord says, you have to get rid of that. Because maybe there was manipulation and control in that relationship. Other spirits at play, and those spirits can attach themselves to these objects that you're given. So, it's super important to be mindful, ask God for that discernment, to discern what we have in our possession that we should not have. And one of the things, when I get witchcraft dreams, one of the first things we do, my husband and I, is we look at what we have. Did we get anything new? Was anything given to us? Did we pick up anything we shouldn't have? We look at patterns, telling you, how witchcraft stay, you know, is that it clouds your mind. So you don't even realize, you, you may feel stupid after, but I'm here to say no judgment to anybody who may have a, a, an object or something in your possession and you didn't realize because witchcraft can actually affect your mind so you don't. Enough times in the past, pastor have a shirt. And, and I think one time in particular, he mentioned a, a shirt that he was wearing for a while and then the Holy Spirit opened his eyes to the shirt that had, what was it, a dragon on it or something? A castle, I don't quite remember. But it had something on it that he, a dragon, yes, that he was just blinded to because of witchcraft. But of course, as soon as he's, he's made aware through the Holy Spirit, that type of dash way, you repent of having it. it, you may need to burn it, cut it up, dash it away, just get it out of your house. Um, I had a perfume that was given to me and I like the perfume and there's nothing wrong with, I mean, the person who gave it to me was very thoughtful, nothing wrong with it at all. And, um, Holy Spirit had given the apostle instruction to check, um, our ottoman because there was something in there that shouldn't be in there. And when we go into the ottoman and check, I see this perfume and the perfume, the name of the perfume is Rebel. This is something I was spraying on myself. Now, maybe somebody else could own Rebel and it wouldn't affect them. But for me, 
and where the Lord is taking me and me knowing I have to walk the straight and narrow because the enemy is always looking for an in in my life. That was a big no-no. And let me tell you how the, the enemy dangerous. I was also gifted another rebel. So I actually had two of them. I had one that I was using and an unopened one. He's just making sure that I have enough rebel perfume to last me. And the Holy Spirit showed us and that was gone, no questions asked. I was given a, a gold chain and it was actually very precious to me, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, some things are harder to let go of, but we just have to move in obedience, people of like God. God will replace and restore all that we give up for his kingdom. And because of who had given me it, I didn't, you know, even though something was nudging me about it, I just, I didn't want to part with it, to be honest. And this was when I had just come to Christ. And because I didn't know much about witchcraft, but I knew that I was supposed to do some spiritual house cleaning. I'd give, gotten that instruction. And I was, that's when I I'd just come to Christ. I was getting rid of a lot of things. And when I came upon this chain, I didn't want to, but I wasn't sure. So I remember carrying it to church and I asked a minister to look at the chain and to tell me what she thought of it. And she held the chain and immediately it was like, her hand started to burn her. And I knew the chain was demonic and it had to go. And it was, had to have been um, the origins of the chain. And maybe who was involved in the making of it, you know? And so, but that had to go. And let me tell you, even if people who give you those gifts, even if they don't understand, I think I know our soul is more important. Our spiritual health is more important. Don't be afraid to let go of something because you think somebody's going to feel a way. Because the Lord also knows this and he compensates for all of it. I see you, Apostle Rebecca, saying you have those experiences. Amen. So we are not ignorant to the plans of the enemy. We're not ignorant to witchcraft. And we're here to break every witchcraft over our lives. And I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to go too much into stories and miss the focus of what I want to talk about. And I want to really educate us and make us aware of the effects of witchcraft. So witchcraft is a counterfeit spiritual authority. It's counterfeit. And if Anybody believes that they can gain spiritual authority, true spiritual authority with, with witchcraft, they're sadly mistaken. It will always collapse because it is not true spiritual authority. So we may feel like we can gain something, a position at work, the person we want, um, fin finances um, through, through this counterfeit spiritual authority and it may feel like it worked but it will always collapse on itself the word of god says for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry that's in first samuel 15 23 what does it say for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and why does it say that what does that mean? Rebellion, why do we rebel? We rebel because we want to get our own way, right? We rebel because we want our own desires. And if you continue to rebel, because you want your own desires, then what does that mean? You're going to do whatever it takes to get it. You'll manipulate, you'll control, and you dominate. And so rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's where it leads. And that's why you hear the Lord always talk about being obedient, being obedient. Because rebellion, even in one area, even if it might seem small to you, there's no such thing as small rebellion. Rebellion is rebellion. And it will lead us down a path 
if it is not course corrected quickly. And that's the greatest example of witchcraft, I think, it comes through rebellion. Because we seek to, witchcraft is when you seek to manipulate, right, through spiritual means. And rebellion is like witchcraft because in essence, you are following another spirit to do or get what you want. When you're engaged in rebellion, you're following after your own spirit to pursue your own desires. And you know, if you realize that you're operating in rebellion in any way, it's, it's a simple prayer of repentance. But repentance means not just saying sorry, God, it means turning away. So you have to do the opposite of what you were doing. So I, you know, I always tell a story. I have to just draw on that testimony of when the Lord showed me a donkey in my living room. Lord was saying I was stubborn like a donkey. But there was rebellion in my life. And it was one area. It was specifically regarding playing the keyboard for church. The Lord was trying to do something through obedience um, in my life with that. And I was rebelling. My answer was always no, no, no. I was the queen of no. So I'll tell everybody, can you pray? No, I can't. You know, can you play the keyboard today? Uh, sorry, I can't. Can you come and take over for me? I need to, you know, if the, the pastor who was playing the keyboard needed somebody to take over because I needed a break. Nope, I'm sorry, I can't. I would find the nearest exit and make an excuse. And it was, it, it was because of fear. That doesn't matter. Because the enemy was using my fear to cripple me into rebellion. And that was taking me down a slippery road. And so the Lord said, you're rebellious. And when I got that dream, and then I got the interpretation of the dream, I felt really bad. And that's, but that was a conviction I need that I'm not gonna, I, this donkey has to go. So I repented, repented of my rebellion. I repented of having this donkey in my house. I cast that donkey out. And then I realized that, well, for me to, Pass the donkey out, for the donkey to stay out. I have to do the opposite of what I didn't want to do. And that was, I have to play the keyboard. I have to say yes when someone at church asked me to do something despite my fears. And I did. I said, I made, I made a vow with God that day. I said, God, I will play the keyboard every single Sunday. I didn't have to, you know, I mean, the leaders weren't saying I have to play it every Sunday, but I said, I need, I am going to play it every Sunday. And anything that is asked of me, I'm going to say yes. And I made that commitment to the Lord and it, and I followed through with it. And yes, I was afraid. Yes, sometimes I felt like I embarrassed myself. Yeah, it didn't always go well. Yeah, I said yes, even though inside I was like, no, I don't wanna, I wanna do this, but I did it anyway. And over time, what happened was that my fear just kind of disappeared because the biggest thing that I was afraid of was failing. And then when I did fail sometimes, well, in my eyes, I realized, well, hey, that's failing is not so bad, right? You just get up and you go again. And there's another Sunday and there's more songs and you didn't get the song this week, but you'll get it next week. And that was the biggest lesson for me. And so my fear started to disappear until I realized, hey, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to go up in front of everybody and play that keyboard every single Sunday. In fact, I started to look forward to it. And so through my obedience, I was blessed. And I was able to bless others. But I know that I passed that test that I wasn't passing at the time when the Lord said there was a donkey there. So it was a repentance and a course correction. And all of us are capable of that. And sometimes it, it seems too hard to you in your mind. And I believe a lot of that is manipulated by the enemy. The enemy makes it look like it's the worst thing in the world for you to do this thing or be obedient to this thing. And it's really and truly not because the Holy Spirit is our helper and he promises to help us. What we have to do is we have to surrender and we have to say yes and allow the Holy Spirit then to help us. And he helped me. There was many times that I felt he just took my fingers and played the song. Or I just felt in my spirit that this is the right key. 
there were many times that happened and I knew the Holy Spirit was with me. We have to be careful of turning to persons for quick results or objects or things or mediums. And I'm talking about like um, spiritual healing. And I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit going to spiritists, mediums for immediate healing. That's such a dangerous thing to do. And the pastor has a testimony about a girl. Pastor, you remember that testimony with the girl in the chain? Are you in a position to share that quickly? I don't quite. Yeah, you. sure. Um, what had happened is that this, this girl, the yeah, parent's daughter, was sick. And uh, are you hearing me? Yeah, hearing you. Right. And what they did is that they, the parents, they were Christian. They took, they took her to a spiritual healer. And the spiritual healer, uh, she actually got healed. And um, I think sometime after, you know, the girl was rebelling and, you know, just started to do some crazy things, some left field stuff. And it, it, it drew up the parents to, to get saved. And they actually ended up accepting the Lord. And, um, you know, the spiritual healer gave her a team with a heart in them. And when they got saved, the old spirit, you know, every time they crossed past that thing that they were disturbed in their spirit. And they just took it one day and when they opened it and looked, it apparently could have opened and opened it. They saw this little paper and it was tied with a red ribbon. And when they opened it, the paper and looked at it, it says, Satan, keep this child well until our soul burn in hell. So, um, there was an exchange that takes place. Remember, you know, the devil can heal. Even in Revelation, it speaks of the, 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 state, um, the Antichrist getting a fatal wound and like resurrecting back up. Um, so the devil can do this thing, but there is always um, a cost to it which you can't pay for. So the, the note said, with that red ribbon, Satan keep this child well until her soul burning hell. Amazing, right? And amazing how that whole time they hadn't opened that locket. And that's what witchcraft does. It blinds us that they didn't even think to open it until the Holy Spirit himself, because they got saved, said, hey, look at that. And we need to reverse that. We need to cancel and break that. That God for the Holy Spirit I see uh, Shauna wrote last week, Tuesday, I dreamt that I was vomiting and it was a snail that came up. I was told by a pastor that whenever we dream things like these, God has already dealt with it. So that snail, it's a spirit, that spirit of delay and slowness to make things not happen in your life, materialize quickly. And you vomiting that up is deliverance. So yes, indeed, you've been delivered from that snail spirit that was affecting your life. So thank God and you bless the Lord for that, you know, and just receive um, that dream. That's a wonderful dream. And yeah, witchcraft can affect us in those ways. It can affect us that it feels like anything we try doesn't work or anything we put our hands to or everything takes so much longer than it should because the power of witchcraft is at work. Minister Shardo, also shared a testimony. I remember I bought a pajama set, lovely silk, long pants and robe. And the day I got it, I was like, wow, this is beautiful, blue and cold. My husband was the one who pointed out the dragon wrapped all around it. And I felt so embarrassed because I spent money on it and missed the design and was like, maybe I can keep it, but not wear it. But he said, no, you need to get rid of it. And the day I decided to throw it away, someone sowed a seed into my life for the exact amount so I could replace it with something better. Amen. That's a, a perfect example of the effect witchcraft has, but also God's grace and compensation. And you know, that's true. Another effect of witchcraft is that even when we realize the object is 
not of the Lord, we try to justify a way to keep it. You know, like there was a, a dress recently as well that I was like, I sh- I just showed my husband, I was like, mm, what do you think about this? It's, I think Holy Spirit is nudging me. And he was like, yeah. And then we're just like, well, let's pray about it. Pray over the dress. And then the next day we were like, no, we're not compromising. Why do I have to keep that dress? I can get another dress, throw away the dress. You know, why keep the perfume? Why do you have to keep that chain? What is the significance of it that you cannot part with it? And if you're struggling to part with something that badly, then that's a big indication that there's a spiritual effect there. Shauna asks, this means that the sin of rebellion is as if you have committed witchcraft. And yes, I see Minister Sharda Apostle said, yes, that is absolutely right. And so let us just go to signs that witchcraft might be affecting your life. I see Apostle started the conversation in the chat. Start off by you not praying, reading the word, no devotion, and you don't even realize it. How many of us has that happened to? It's like, you you just don't feel this desire to go in the word. You don't want to, you can't find the time. You're demotivated to do that. And you feel bad about it too, especially if you're mature enough to know you're supposed to. You feel bad that you're not doing it, but you're still not doing it you know, or as Apostle said, you don't even realize you're not doing it until you take a stock and you're like, hey, I haven't even prayed, not even all day, not even all week, I have not even prayed. So some signs that you're under witchcraft, exactly as Apostle said, a lack of motivation, desire to pray or to get in the word, Physical pain, especially in the neck, in the back, joint pain or sharp pains, um, usually or can be in the chest area. Shortness of breath, your heart racing. So when there's a demonic presence, my heart races. And shortness of breath for me, in my experience, has always been an attack. because the Lord had told me that when the enemy attacks my breathing, it is attack against my purpose, my life, my purpose. And so anytime I have shortness of breath, and on the, I know it's a demonic attack. Physical tiredness, you are just extra tired all the time. You know, like more than the usual, like really fatigued. And sometimes it can be a deep spiritual tiredness brain fog, you just can't think clearly. And this could be consistent or only at times, like when Bible study keeping, you can't stay awake, none at all, no matter how hard you try. Even if you weren't tired before Bible study, once Bible study comes on, your eyes are closing. Or you're having a conversation with somebody about God and your brain just gets all foggy every time you talk about God. Or you're praying, Sometimes that used to happen with me and my husband, like we're praying together. And when he's praying, I have no recollection of what he's praying. It's like, I cannot even focus on his words. And then I understand that there's a spirit there. Dreams, you can have these strange dreams, dreams that don't make any sense, demonic, nasty dreams, um, sexual dreams, um, dreams that are chaotic and confusing, dreams that you are eating or stuffing your face. I'm going very quickly here, I'm sorry. These are all examples of witchcraft dreams. Um, Dreams of rats, roaches, lizards, um, you know, feces, nasty things all over the place. All of these can be witchcraft dreams. And it's important to, to deal with that in the spiritual realm meaning cancel those dreams, because as Apostle says in the chat, you can be reprogrammed through your dreams. So that's how witchcraft can get to you, right? So for example, let's say you're on a fast. You've said you're gonna fast and the minute you're fasting, you're just getting dreams, you're just eating, eating, eating. And if those dreams are not dealt with, what you find is after a few days, you can't even fast no more, you have to just eat. You can't fast no more. 
you know, um, or those chaotic, confusing, mix up dreams start to affect your mind that you wake up miserable. You wake up affected. You wake up, you don't want to pray. You find that you don't want nothing to do with God today. And you don't know why you just upset and cross. Think about your, if that has happened to you, think about, did you dream something that night? Why did you wake up this way? It could have been that while you slept, you had a demonic attack. Especially when you know, you recognize it's not your emotions. Like why I feel this way, I, I shouldn't feel this way. I got enough sleep. You know, all is going well in my life, but I just feel so irritated and angry and upset or depressed. And those are indications that, hey, maybe there's a, a spirit affecting you. Strange occurrences, even in the natural, seeing a lot of lizards, frogs. We, um, a few, more, a year or so ago, um, another place that we lived, um, look out the window, there was just this dead bird dead bird just lying there. And it was in such a weird position and at such, cause it wasn't there before all of a sudden dead bird. And we, we, we knew that that was a form of witchcraft. Feeling a demonic presence. Sometimes the Lord may wake you up at two, three in the morning, call those a witching hours. That's when demonic presence is at its heaviest because um, demons get strength from darkness. God is light devil is darkness and so demons get strength from the darkness from the full moon and so they love for try to come out at those times and so if you are attacking witchcraft sometimes a key the lord may tell you is to pray at midnight pray at two in the morning pray at three in the morning that might be hard to do especially if you're not woken up to do so but midnight prayers are extremely effective uh, and you'll find sometimes you just wake up. And if you wake up and you check the time and you see 2, 2 30, and you don't even have the, the desire to go back to sleep, pray, because the chances are the Lord is waking you up to pray. I remember once I was sleeping and um, Apostle woke up. He just woke up. And we woke up, he smelled something foul, like something stink. And I was like, what's that? I'm following a stench. Um, and, you know, went, followed the stench to see it was in the kitchen and Joseph was there and Joseph smelt it as well and followed the No matter how they're looking around, they can't find the source of the stench. And then I also realized this is a foul spirit that is here. And he prayed, it smelled like sulfur. Thank you. And he prayed immediately, of course. You pray, you run out any demon, you bind every spirit. Tell it to take its flight and to leave. Plead the blood of Jesus over your, your home and over the people in your home. And the smell went immediately after he prayed. And interestingly, that I I'd fallen asleep with the baby in a different room. At that time, I put into bed and I fell asleep. And I woke up, not knowing that that was happening, but I woke up at 2.30 and I was like, can't go back to sleep. Why am I awake? Why am I awake? And I was like, let me pray. And I prayed and I was just praying in tongues, praying in tongues. And I learned the next day what the apostle told me. Amen. So the Lord may wake us up to pray. And if you get a dream and you wake up, night is not over and you remember the dream and it is a demonic dream, take a moment and pray. Because sometimes I find when you go back to sleep, you don't remember the dream anymore. And so the parts of the dream that you know are demonic, just pray and cancel it. Right, that's a that's a tip. Other signs that you are on is everybody following me? By the way, am I moving way too fast, or are you okay? I hope you're learning. I hope you're following. Um, we're gonna stop soon. You know, next time I don't know if we next week or the week after, but we will you know, delve into more things surrounding witchcraft, but this is supposed to be an overview and a broad understanding of it, right? And I want to get through, I have to get through how to defeat it. Can't talk about witchcraft and not give you tools and tips, more tools and tips to overcome it. I see Peter Gay, you could write a book on these based on your experiences. My girl, you have a deliverance ministry inside of you. And so the Lord has allowed you 
to experience these things over and over again. So yes, maybe you are supposed to write a book, who knows? One other sign that you may be under witchcraft we call the eight stings. And the eight stings are basically um, symptoms or effects of witchcraft, right? And we call it the eight stings um, because it starts with discouragement and it, it ends with the final sting is defeat, which is the devil's ultimate purpose is he wants to defeat you. You don't, I'm going to talk through the stings, but just to let you know, you may not experience every sting, right? And but what we have found is that the enemy sting you with discouragement. And then if, if that isn't dealt with, he'll sting you with something else and sting you with something else. And it's like a compounding issue, compounding effect to make you feel defeated and ultimately lose all hope and give up. And it almost always starts with discouragement. So it could be manipulated by the enemy. Like let's say there was a job or something you were going for and you didn't get it. And maybe you should have gotten it, but the enemy stepped in. Or it could just be you wake up feeling discouraged. You don't know why, but you just feel discouraged, right? But it starts that way. So you feel discouraged demotivated. I know we can all relate to that. You don't know why, but you just feel like you don't want to do anything. You just feel blah. You know, you feel very negative. Sting number two, so that's one, discouragement. Sting number two is confusion. So discouragement can easily lead to confusion. So you're continually in this state of discouragement and demotivation, and then you may start to question a lot of things. Am I hearing from God? Did God really want me to do this? Do I really know how to hear God's voice? I'm confused. What am I supposed to do? What's happening? What's going on in my life? And that's very typical. That follows the discouragement. If you don't start to encourage yourself and to attack that spirit of discouragement, it can develop into confusion. And that could lead to number three, depression. So now you're already questioning if you're hearing from the Lord. And so you start to feel depressed and you start to feel down. You don't want to do nothing. You don't want to wake up, you don't get out of the bed. You don't want to leave your house. You just don't have no desire. And then that, the fourth sting may add to, to depression and that is loss of vision. So now the depression turns into loss of vision. You don't even, you, you feel like you're not, you don't even hear from God. You don't even know what God is saying or what direction you're to go to. You're completely lost. You feel like you can't hear his voice. You feel like you can't see him in anything. Number five, disorientation. So if you're not, feeling like you are aligned with the Lord, if you, you have that loss of vision, it's gonna make you feel eventually disoriented, right? And it's where you don't even know where to go. Left, right, up, down. That's disorientation. And if you don't attack these things there, can lead to number six, which is withdrawal. And that's when you pull away from everybody. God, your loved ones, your friends, you withdraw into yourself. Because now you have no confidence in yourself. You have no confidence that you're hearing from God. And so you start to isolate. And number seven is despair. Withdrawal, especially if you're withdrawing from God and from people who are the voice of God in your life. You're going to feel that despair. I can't do this. I feel hopeless. There's no hope. There's no chance. There's no way out. And then number eight, which I declare nobody will ever reach, is defeat. 
where enemy has now gotten you to walk away, take your life, turn away from God, turn to something you shouldn't turn to, make a vow with the enemy. And that is defeat. Now, at any point in time, you know, and, and I, I believe it's very hard to get to defeat, right? Because God loves us. And at every, at every sin, he's going to talk to us or he's going to send somebody to talk to us, right? Um, and so, and, and you may skip some of them. You may not feel discouragement, confusion, depression. Or after depression, you go straight to despair. You may not experience loss of vision or disorientation. I'm somebody that I, in the past, I used to get depressed a lot. And the enemy always kept me down with depression. So I would think that if I got a sting, it went straight to depression first. It was very easy to get me and keep me depressed until I learned to overcome the spirit of depression. And it doesn't affect me at all anymore. I can't remember the last time I was ever depressed. And it's something that I used to feel daily. So see, those are all signs that witchcraft could be affecting your life, all right? And if I identify any of what I am saying, and I know there are a lot, any of the stings, the dreams, the, the physical effects, um, the spiritual feelings, if you know that you did something like a tarot card reading, or if you've done something that you acknowledge um, is not of the Lord, how can you fix that? Now, I'll tell you another quick testimony. I, in my past, I did a tarot card reading and I definitely thought it was innocent. I was not saved at the time. But I, it, to me, that was just innocent and silly. And it was at a fair in Kingston. And let me tell you how the enemy did trap me. I went with my sister. We're actually um, selling, we're, we're actually at the fair selling some stuff for my mother. And there was another booth there. And it was this girl doing tarot card reading. And, you know, I was... I was intrigued by it. And interestingly enough, my sister was, wasn't interested, but I was the one that was intrigued. And I remember talking to my sister about it and I was like, mm. she was like, we'll do it then. And I was like, I don't know, I'm not sure. And the lady, the tarot card reader, she fully walks over to me and my sister and says, which one of you wants a reading? And it was the exact timing we were talking about it. And of course I'm like, oh, you're, she's psychic, she knows, you know, wow, what are the chances of that? And so I was like, okay, me. And I followed her into her booth, into her tent. And she, I don't remember exactly what she did. She flipped the tarot cards. She thinks she looks at my palm, and I think, but she flipped the tarot cards for sure. And she started to tell me things about my life. And I mean, now, like, they, they were so general. But there's some specific things she said, and this was a long time for I was anywhere near married and she said um that the man I was going to be with she told me something completely different like he wasn't going to live in Jamaica he drives this big vehicle I already know him and I remember writing those things down and saying who could that be and what she was doing what this what the spirit was doing that was using her what the spirit was doing was rewriting my destiny All the things she said was an enemy trying to rewrite my destiny. And I received it because I didn't know any better. And I'll tell you what's even worse about that. Got her number and I think somebody else went to her house to get a tarot card reading. And then when I got saved and I learned my Bible study about tarot card readings, and I, and I remember, I think it was Apostle doing the Bible study, he asked, anybody got a tarot card reading? And I was like, oh boy. And when I, I learned what I didn't know before and everything just cut, the, I remember the blood leaving my face and I was like, oh my goodness, 
And I remember everybody joined. I admitted that I had done it. And those that had done it, you know, repented of it. And we prayed and we were prayed over to break all of those things. And I know that in the spirit, it took me several times. Even on my own, I had to cancel all of those things she spoke over my life. And that was important. Because without that, something as that seems as simple as that, I would not be here today. So can't take any of those things lightly. All right. Last thing, some tools to overcome witchcraft. Now we have already mentioned a few of them, and I'll just repeat. The first one, of course, is repentance. All right? It's 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 acknowledging that. We, we intentionally or unintentionally um, agree to something or went into something that we shouldn't have, right? And that's the first thing is that we have to humble ourselves and admit that and repent of it. Yes, Minister Saras, she's saying sometimes we make agreement with the enemy and don't know because we don't understand, definitely. That it that is that was definitely me with a tarot card reading, and I know it's a lot of people when we buy things, when we read horoscopes. There was a time Apostle talks about it; he couldn't leave the house. This is when he was young, way before he was saved. He couldn't leave the house without reading his horoscope to know what's going to happen that day. And there's a time that he reached on the bus, realized he didn't read his horoscope, and turned back to read it. Right, and and that's how these things can have that effect on us. So we, of course, we need to deal with it in prayer, right? So once we repent, and remember repenting is turning away from that sin. So there has to be a conviction in your heart that you're not going to do this anymore. If it's something you are doing or you did, whatever it is, a turning away from that sin, right? And of course, we pray. So whether whatever it is, if it's a dream, something we did, um, demonic presence, you know, we pray. And as you hear us praying, I mean, you heard Minister Sharda praying earlier, an apostle, you hear me praying and you can get, you can get tips on how to pray and how to pray for yourself. Praying in tongues, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's a very powerful tool because oftentimes we may not be able to identify the exact spirit or know exactly how to pray. And so praying in tongues is praying in that heavenly language it's the holy spirit using your tongue to pray so it's perfect perfect language perfect way to pray and so if you are baptized in the holy spirit it's important that you spend significant time just sitting and praying praying in tongues and if you are not baptized in the holy spirit this is something that you can ask the holy spirit for and from time to time we minister the baptism of the holy spirit and even on zoom persons get filled with the holy spirit um, baptized with the Holy Spirit and are able to speak in tongues. So there's no barriers where it comes to God. It doesn't matter that we're here on Zoom. The Holy Spirit is everywhere with us and we just have to have the faith that it can happen. Praise and worship. Oftentimes under witchcraft attacks, we feel like we can't pray. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. A good thing to do is to praise. If you don't know and you feel confused and you're feeling those things, just start to sing a praise song. If you can't even sing a praise song, play a praise song until you can sing a praise song. Right? Um, when we, we learn that when we pray, we put on the full armor of God. And so if, if you don't know those scriptures, get those scriptures put on that armor daily, that is a defense against the enemy. Using prophetic words to stand on, prophetic words we have received. So I may be feeling depressed, discouraged, or hell is breaking loose in my life. But what I can stand upon is the word of God that says, um, well, I know by the word that I'm a I'm victorious, I'm a conqueror in Christ, but I may have gotten personal prophetic words, you know, that speak to my destiny. You know, I am a billionaire. I can stand on that prophetic word. I am a prophetess. 
I have a deliverance ministry. I have a successful business. So if the enemy is attacking my business and attacking my finances, I'm going to speak what the word of God said about me, that I'm going to be rich and wealthy, that I'm going to have a successful business, that I'm going to minister to people all around the world. Whatever it is that the enemy is attacking, say the opposite. It's your health. You know, speak the opposite. Stand upon the word of God. Next time, I want to talk about walking in true spiritual authority. And I want to talk about um, ensuring that we're not exalting ourselves before the proper time. Ensure that we're not seeking influence or authority prematurely. And I want to go into detail with that, you know, using the story of David and Saul and how to walk in true spiritual authority. The enemy is counterfeit spiritual authority. And the true and living God is us walking in true spiritual authority. And there's a way to do that. And so I want to give you the roadmap to walk in true spiritual authority, because that is how we're going to um, preserve our ter territory. That is how we're going to expand in the kingdom. That is how we're going to make sure that our lives are like a fortress that cannot be penetrated by the enemy. That's how we're going to live in peace. Because if you're trying to do things in your own means, your own strength, there's no peace. You will never have peace. True peace is when we're moving in, we're allowing God to establish us. Right, and I wanna talk a bit about us next, next time, how we allow God to establish us, right? It's, it can be hard to wait on God in that way and allow him to, um, but I wanna encourage you that it is possible and it is the only way. It is the only way for true success. Getting success any other way is not true success. It is counterfeit success and it will come tumbling down. But the good thing is that we allow God to establish us. The word says that he will exalt us at the proper time. That is a guarantee and a reassurance by God. And that's how we're gonna ensure that we are not subject to witchcraft, that we're not under witchcraft when we are walking in that true spiritual authority. Father, we thank you and we praise your name, mighty God. We honor you, mighty God. And we just declare your goodness in our lives. Mighty God, we thank you that we know who you say we are. And we thank you, Lord, that we are not ignorant to the plans of the enemy, mighty God. We thank you, Father, that you break the powers of the dark and powers of witchcraft, mighty God. We thank you, Lord, that as we surrender to you, Father God, you help us and you strengthen us when we need it, mighty God. You your word says that you are very present help in times of need, mighty God, in times of trouble. We thank you, mighty God, that we are protected and covered by you, mighty God. We thank you that you are our refuge, O oh Lord. And even now, mighty God, we repent. We repent of our sins, Lord. We repent, mighty God, of anything that we may have done, whether intentionally, unintentionally, mighty God, that exalts itself against you, mighty God, that is has moved us further from you, mighty God. That is not of you. We repent of those things, mighty God. We repent of every tarot card reading. We repent, mighty God, of every rebellion. We repent, mighty God, of having items that we shouldn't have. We repent, mighty God, of receiving demonic dreams that we didn't um, bind and cancel, mighty God. We repent, Father, of submitting to the enemy, mighty God, in any, any way. And we thank you that you have forgiven us, mighty God. And we thank you that you are helping us to overcome witchcraft and to overcome every power and, and plan of the enemy in the name of Jesus. And so now, Lord, we bind and break every spirit of witchcraft, mighty God, every mind-bending spirit, every spirit that blocks our will, Father God, every spirit, mighty God, of rebellion, we bind and break. We bind and break every spirit of rejection. We bind and break every spirit of anger, hatred, bitterness, malice, slander, resentment, pride, destruction, perversion, and deception. In the name of Jesus, we bind and break the spirits of fear, greed, addiction, 
We repent, mighty God, of any evil practiced, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. We repent, Father God, of all rebellion, mighty God. And we thank you, Lord, that you have covered us, mighty God. We thank you that we are humble. We thank you that we are obedient, Lord. We thank you, mighty God, that we, are, we have surrendered to your will, mighty God, and we're moving in alignment to your will for our life. Thank you for washing away our iniquities. Thank you, mighty God, for a quickening in the spiritual realm even now, Lord. Thank you for showing us the way Satan may be deceiving us. Thank you for showing us where we may be deceiving ourselves and where we are believing lies and falsehoods. Thank you for revealing how our spiritual walk might be affected and helping us to overcome and showing us how to pray. Thank you for showing us the areas that the enemy is tempting us, mighty God and where he is counterfeiting and distorting the truth in our lives. We claim in every way Jesus' victory over all satanic forces, and we reject those forces now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, mighty God, that we are warriors, mighty God, prepared for battle. I thank you we are vigilant and militant in the spirit, in the name of Jesus. We claim victory over Satan by putting on the whole armor of God. We put on the girdle of truth. We stand firm in the truth of your word so we are not a victim to Satan's lies. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. May it guard our hearts against evil so we will remain pure and holy, protected under the blood of Jesus Christ. We put on the shoes of peace. May we stand firm in the good news of the gospel so your peace will shine through us and be a light to all we encounter. We take the shield of faith. May we discern Satan's fiery darts of doubt, denial, and deceit so we will not be vulnerable to spiritual defeat. We put on the helmet of salvation May we keep our mind focused on you so Satan will not have a stronghold on our thoughts. And we take the sword of the spirit. May the two-edged sword of your word be ready in our hands so we can expose the tempting words of Satan. By faith, we have put on the whole armor of God and we are prepared to live this day in spiritual victory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.